wildest game in college basketball this season happened tonight. We had triple overtime. We had buzzer beaters. We had monitors that froze. We had rain coming down from the ceiling in the rafters uh, arch. Have you ever seen anything like this Providence Xavier game? No, that was one of the wilder games that uh, that you will see. I mean, it had it had all the all the makings, you know, going on at one time. You also had two teams playing like their life was on the line. I mean, you had to give Xavier credit. They had a, a number of guys step up and, and, and be right there multiple times to win the game. But Providence, Providence is, is a hard kill. I mean, they, they have found a way this year to do that, what they did tonight, it seems like 10 times. And uh, being their third overtime win in four games, they just have a bunch of guys that are used to it. And, you know, really it comes down to guard play in those type of situations. And Jared Bynum, you can't give him enough credit what he's doing for Providence right now. Yeah, Jared Bynum um, hit the big three in the third overtime before he started cramping up to uh, to give Providence a five-point lead. The final ended up being 99-92. to Bynum finished with 27 points uh, coming off of the bench. Al Durham had 13-6. and six. Uh, Nate Watson was held a little bit in check, but he made a couple big plays down the stretch. Uh, Sean, what's your what's your takeaway from this Providence team? We were talking about it a little bit before we went on air. They are 23 and three. They have a two game lead over the field in the Big East, which is one of the better conferences in college basketball this season. And they rank 46th in Kempom. That doesn't happen ever. Well, Rob, you know, I think you have to just, uh, you know, tonight, I, I think we have to just give Providence all the respect in the world. Um, they're just in and have been in an abundance of close games, hard fought games in a terrific conference. And they've come out on top almost in an improbable way. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's coaching. Sometimes it's the individual player making big plays at timely in a timely situation. And, and sometimes I think it's just all out will and, you know, what Providence's fans and what the dunk has turned into, which I think this year, one of the most exciting arenas to watch a game in all of college basketball, they should share in some of the joy as well. It's their will that I think inspires that group. It's not easy to play Providence right now at home and beat them. And if you do it, it's a Herculean effort like, you know, Villanova was able to accomplish. But Rob, I would just say from my perspective, being out West and Obviously, I'm a big fan of the Big East, having played in it a billion years ago. You know, you watch the UConn-Villanova game earlier in the week, and then you watch tonight Providence and Xavier, and it's just Big East basketball. What an exciting conference uh, filled with terrific coaches, great home courts. I think just the passion in New England really shines through watching both UConn and Providence uh, where they're at in you know, I think Ed Cooley, there's there's certain things that have to happen to be named the national coach of the year. And I think tonight was one of those things that you have to start really looking hard at what guy deserves it more than Ed Cooley. What guy? I, mean, I, I don't know if you can. There's a lot in his company or at least a few in his company. But what he has done with that team is uh, is extraordinary. Yeah, one I would say deserves some consideration is playing right now on ESPN. That is John Calipari uh, for what he's yep. done with Kentucky. But I, I do. You, you mentioned you played in the Big East, Sean. Um, when you were there, did they have the gremlin in the ceiling that turned on the faucet whenever Providence was down <laughs> late in the game? No, that's right. Uh, how about that? Uh, you know, one of the questions I have is where'd the water go? I mean, uh, for a minute there, <laughs> I thought they were talking about busing the teams to the on-campus venue and finishing the game uh, without TV. And next thing you know, the court dried off. So whoever was in charge of cleaning up that mess, man, what a great job they did. My source <laughs> says they, they sent Fanta up on a ladder to the roof and he just started drying off all of the rafters with the towels from his, uh, his hotel room down the street. Yeah. Yeah. He, <laughs> I, I don't know if he was on the roof. I'll stop there. I, I mean, he may have had something to do with, he may have sent someone else on the roof. If he was on the roof, he would have came through with the water onto the floor. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you know what? In all seriousness, though, uh, you know, think about a game in, in Hartford and what that meant to UConn's program and, you know, the, the rise of UConn in the Big East, which we talked about as far back as the month of November, like how great it is to have UConn truly back in the Big East and now thriving. It seems like it helps the Big East. It helps UConn. 
and uh, in New England. And then, you know, now you watch Providence in this game. And look, Xavier deserves a lot of credit. Like, you know, some people want Xavier to break through and win one of these close ones here down the stretch. There was really no loser in tonight's game. I thought they were the better team for most of the night. They had a couple opportunities to win the game. They didn't. Providence made the plays, and Providence ended up being the winner. So let's talk about some of those decisions down the stretch and those plays, Arch. Uh, Providence, uh, the first one I want to go to is the foul that, that Jack Nungy committed, right, where he was, for the people that didn't see it, uh, Xavier was up, by, was down by one. There was seven seconds left on the clock. He was at half court. Xavier, uh, Providence had the ball under their own basket, looking to go full court to try to get the ball, and they were going to get fouled. And Nunji just basically bear hugged Nate Watson at half court to try to intentionally foul him, put on the foul line. It ended up being, was it a flagrant intention? I'm not sure exactly what the call was. I think was, it was a it flagrant ended- one. It was a flagrant one. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he, he wasn't an eligible receiver at, the, at that point when the ball went live. The official was standing right next to him. And it looked like a blatant foul that wasn't even a part of the action. So you could see where it was called. I doubt very highly that Xavier, his staff or their team told him to do that. Maybe even Jack didn't, wasn't aware uh, of, of the rule. Maybe he thought he was going to get a dead ball foul, but it was clearly, um, you know, there's a, there's a rule in place for that. You can't intentionally foul a guy when the ball is really not in, in play or in action. It's an, it's a foul that, uh, you know, it's very rarely called to be honest with you in that situation, but uh, you know, they were able to get a foul shot out of that. I think one make from Nate Watson, um, the game ended up going, you know, to the third overtime because of the missed free throw on the, on the, on the next play. But uh, that foul uh, was a tough one to take at that point in time in the game. That was a look, that's the difference between the NBA and college Rob in that that's the hack a shack, right? You can't intentionally grab somebody that's away from the action. He's not an available receiver. He doesn't have the ball in his hands. He's not cutting to receive the ball. He's just standing. You saw it on the other side of half court within three feet of the official. If to, to bear hug him, you just committed an intentional foul. You're not allowed to do that in college. It was the correct call. It was a big, big play in, in, the, in the game. Uh, really, I mean, Providence could have put it away right then and there. So I know Xavier lived for another day, but those special situations as we get towards the end of the season, boy, these are the teachable moments for both Providence and Xavier, where you want to learn from what you did right and what you did wrong. So that when, you know, this single elimination tournament, whether it's the big East tournament or the NCAA tournament, and you're participating in both that, that when that play happens again, that you make the correct play and help your team win. And, you know, that's the beauty of playing in a conference like the big East there's so many lessons that these players are learning throughout the course of, of league play in January and February. All right. So you mentioned a little bit earlier, Sean, about uh, the big East and how it kind of feels um, great having UConn back. And it feels a little bit old big East vibes. I do think it's important to note that by winning this game, Providence ensured they still have a two game lead over Villanova in the big East regular season standings. They have to play Creighton at home on Saturday, and then they end their regular season at Villanova uh, on Tuesday, win one of those games and you get your first big East regular season title in the history of Providence in the big East, which has been like, I think 43. That's why Ed Cooley will be national coach of the year right there. Mm -hmm. He's done. He's done something that they've never done before. And it's his and, program. Uh, and it's, he's been yeah, there for how many years now? Yeah, it's his. And um, that's why he should be if they can pull it out. That Creighton game, by the way, I know the Villanova game is going to be on the road and it's the end of the season. But that Creighton game on Saturday will be every bit as hard as the one they just played tonight. Creighton is playing really well. You know, yeah, Nemhard, I think Nemhard is Nemhard out. He got hurt tonight, right? Yeah, he's getting X-rays right now on a wrist. I didn't see the fall, but it, yeah, uh, it sounded bad. like it was it looked it looked pretty bad. That would be a killer uh, for Creighton. It would be because he's be. probably they, is he not the Big East freshman of the year? He's got to be up there if he's yeah. not. I mean, I would think he's playing yeah. almost thirty-five minutes a game for him. He's probably the Big East freshman of the year. That would be he's a, a tough blow. He's really good. Yeah, yeah. really good player. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that UConn Villanova game last night, because it was back to back nights where we just had utter insanity Um, in the Big East. Kamani Young uh, comes off the bench after Dan Hurley gets two technical fouls uh, about 10 minutes into the game. Uh, What did you guys 
what did you guys think of those texts? Was it right? Was it wrong? I, I, I don't think that that Danny necessarily deserved to get run in that moment, but it kind of felt like this was something where the referees were like, yeah, you know what? You've, you've done enough. I, I don't, I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm, in my, I'm, I'm in my this. opinion, Rob, Danny got tossed last night, probably for weeks or games leading into that. Maybe that official uh, had run-ins at, at the course of the time, or maybe there had been some warnings leading in to the, to the officials that, Hey, if he gets out of hand, or if, if it gets, you gotta, you gotta get him. But uh, to get tossed on that uh, was odd, probably shouldn't have happened in that type of a game. Usually the officials to, to get tossed, you gotta do a lot. But it seemed to me that was something that was leading into that, maybe even a prior, a prior thing or a prior warning that, that didn't come. But uh, for him to get tossed in the game that early, um, I'm sure he didn't try. What, what do hey, you, Rob, what do you... I'm gonna say this. I don't know if I've seen an assistant coach and really not just one, but the whole staff do a better job than UConn staff did. Oh man. Once Danny, you know, was no longer on the bench because that's part two. Can your team function? Do they respect who's on the bench? And then when you get into those late game situations and you have Jay Wright and Villanova down the other end and you have to come out of timeouts and execute like some two of times. the things, some of the things that UConn did and it wasn't just on offense. You know, they got into their press seamlessly after a made field goal. They tied them up without fouling. I mean, they they did, and Kamani deserves a ton of credit. You know, I, I know uh, Tommy and Luke Murray as well. You know, that's why you have to have a great staff. And I'm sure Danny, I'm sure, has addressed that today. But I'm sure he's really proud of, you know, his team, his program, and that staff because that was a pivotal game for UConn. And those guys did a great job. It would have been very easily for them to cave in, especially in crunch time against Villanova. And not only did they not cave in, they thrived. So I think Kamani deserves a lot of credit, and he had a job well done. Yeah, he. have you guys ever been in that situation as an assistant where you had to take over for a coach that was thrown out? I don't no. believe I have. You're, no. You were on the other end. You were the guys that got run. Yeah, I got run one time, and uh, I so didn't I, get. I've never yeah. got. I've never got run. Uh, so, I, I, and I don't believe I've ever been in a situation where the guy that I worked for uh, got tossed as well. Yeah, once in seventeen years, I deserved it, but it is a hard <laughs> thing, and uh, I'm sure when and Danny was watching that game and not being able to coach, that you know, there's a big part of him <laughs> that wanted his team to come out on top because. Uh, I think it reflects really well on him, reflects really well on the staff and, and really the entire UConn program. That was an epic game. I mean, Rob, it was no different than tonight's game, Providence Xavier, except we didn't get into like the, the multiple overtimes, but man, what a great game. Yeah. And there was no rain coming down from the ceiling either. What I need, I need the, the cameras from the locker room so we can see what Danny Hurley was doing as he was watching that game. You didn't need a camera to see that he was on the telephone. <laughs> he was on the telephone talking. He was on the telephone talking to the league office, the league commissioner, the associate commissioner, um, his AD. I mean, he, he was he was definitely communicating with some people before he got out there. Yeah. You know, right, I know talk. Bobby. I know Bobby and Danny very well. Arch, I know you do as well. And I've coached against Bobby, obviously, a lot, but also Danny at both Rhode Island and UConn and uh, I always looked at at Danny as being the better behaved Hurley. I don't <laughs> believe that's true. I, I give the nod to Bobby. And if you noticed the other night, he even put a mask on, and I don't even think he had to against UCLA, just maybe to temper his enthusiasm. But I'm here to tell you, I'm going to give the nod to, to, to Bobby right now on his behavior. I think he has surpassed Danny. Let me ask you guys this, just kind of big picture in the Big East. We've seen what Providence can do in close games. Uh, we've seen, we know what Villanova is when they are at their best. We know what they are just in terms of how old they are, how, how, uh, how skilled they are, how smart they are, all the Villanova stuff. We've now seen UConn won, win four straight games, three in a row at home against tournament teams and one on the road at St. John's. That was a tough kind of uh, play ugly win um, that you got to get when, when you're kind of in those moments. If you have to pick one of those teams from the Big East, 
to make a run to the final four, make a run deep in March. Uh, who are you guys back? And Arch, I'm going to go to you first on this one. I'll go with the, uh, the easy bet, which is Villanova. They're the most experienced. Um, they're the most, you know, veteran hardened group. They have their style, their system, their, their, their uh, culture, so to speak. And I think that Villanova, as they enter NCAA tournament play, has a chance to win multiple games. I don't know if they're a Final Four team. I can't say that. But if you're playing Villanova round one, if you're playing Villanova round two, you're going to have to look at them and say they're the favorite. And if they get another week to play in a Sweet 16 versus uh, I don't know what type of a seed it would be, I could make the case they'll be favored in the third game too. So I think Villanova is a team that on paper you would probably pencil in as a team that's got to win some games. But it's hard to look at Providence and think they're not having a magical season. And it's also hard to look at UConn right now and say they're not built to beat people as big and strong and as talented as they are. I think, you know, Ed Cooley's going to be the national coach of the year. He's going to be the coach of the year in the Big East. All credit given to Providence, but um, style of play and who has the best point guard of that of those teams. I know each one of them has a, a meaningful one, but I don't think Colin Gillespie gets enough credit for how good of an individual player that he is. You know, sometimes when you play at Villanova because they have such a team approach and they've done it for so long, it, it reminds me kind of when Jalen Brunson was in his prime at Villanova. Did everybody really give him enough credit for the great individual talent and player he was. He was kind of like in a myriad of, of greatness of winning national championships and Big East championships. And I think with Colin Gillespie, the reason you don't want to play Villanova in the NCAA tournament is like they have a guy on their team who can get 25 or 30 in a slow down game with a great coach. And I think that makes Villanova the hardest team to beat out of the Big East.